go for it. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about last night. Um, just a quick update, encouraging stories. Um, my, my times might be a little off, but I'll approximate. I showed up about 5 p.m. at the closed off street near the Nance Hyde Temple. And there are crowds that line up to get a good spot for the pageant. And they started lining up pretty quickly, which uh, at a rate that's uh, alarmingly large relative to past years, relative to the Thursday of the first week of the pageant. So I, we can tell that tonight's gonna be overflowing. It's gonna be incredible. But I, um, I show up, I'm jittery, set up my stand. You know, I ask my daughter to pray for me. Um, finally, you know, work up the courage to just stand up and start going at it and uh, preaching. And um, I told people I had five topics that I wanted to talk about. God, um, temple, priesthood, authority, and grace. And so I basically gave a, I think it was about 45 minute sermon, maybe it an hour, I don't know, to this crowd that had uh, initially, I mean, I mean there was maybe 20 people in front of me, I don't know. And when I started preaching, they thinned out immediately and the, so the heads of households stayed to keep their spots in line. Everyone else went to the booths. So I was like, oh, they really thinned out quickly. But what happened is the next 20 minutes, people just started flowing in, trickling in. And so the crowd just started uh, getting bigger. And what was really cool is that the LDS Church did not play, for whatever reason, the music. They usually blast music. Um, and I didn't have to compete with volume. And I just had this attentive crowd. So I tried to keep 15, 20 feet away from them um, and speak in a way that kind of respects the fact that they're at my mercy. They're, they're lined up. Um, it's not a hostile crowd. Um, uh, so I just I preached and preached and preached. And I, I tried to speak at a cadence, uh, <clears throat> to speak slowly with simple words, with pauses, loudly. For all to hear and we had a teenager come up sit the corner just sit with his back against the, the pole and just listen to me the entire time and so I, I got to preach to them and uh, it sort of escalated the volume as the as the crowds got bigger and the uh, uh, the announcements started coming from the loudspeakers and I, I ended with just holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come so it was a really great opportunity to preach and uh, we, we sang. So just a few encouraging stories, though, what, what I really meant to share in this video. Sorry um, to make it longer, Bradley. Um, <clears throat> I did some interviews with Christians about their Nantite experiences. And, I, and a, a guy named, I think Sergio, came up to me and he goes, oh, you're famous on YouTube, I know you. And he briefly talked with me and Bill McKeever. Bill McKeever went off to do the plates thing. And I, I spoke with Sergio and uh, at first, honestly, it did not seem like it was gonna be a satisfying conversation because he was, uh, very apathetic and uh, just didn't care. Um, so uh, he, he presented himself as what I would call an apatheist. I don't believe, I don't disbelieve, I just don't care, I just live my life. Not really important. You know, if I die and I find out one way or the other, then so be it. And so I, I asked him at one point, you know, have you ever heard of an argument for God's existence? And he said, uh, no. He said, well, let me give you uh, the moral argument for God. And the argument goes, it's really simple. If there is no God, there are no objective, moral values and duties. And it usually needs some unpacking. Uh, the objectivity refers to the discoverability. It's not invented by human opinion. It's not uh, constructed by the human mind. It's discovered by the human mind. And if we think differently from it, then we're wrong. Um, so uh, the objectivity of the morals refers to the, the real evil or the real good in certain actions or attitudes or thoughts. Um, and the second premise is that if, um, the second premise is that there are objective moral values and duties. Uh, more commonly put, evil is real, good is real. It, it's, it's, a, it's an objectively true description of things in the world. Uh, at least some things, at least some things are really evil and really good. And so at this point, he, he could understand where the, the conclusion is. Because there are objective moral values and duties, and because in the absence of God we wouldn't have them, God does exist. So what he did is he spent, we maybe spent 20 minutes addressing his direction. He argued that, well, it's just a social construct. There are no, there's no real right, no real wrong. It's just uh, relative, it's just subjective, we just invent it. 
And so I usually use the example these days of um, the molestation of a child. When a child is molested or raped, that is evil. And uh, Sergio argued, no, it's not evil. It's just, it's just something that it's socially constructed. You know, he says, I wouldn't do it, and I wouldn't like it if other people did, but that's just me, and that's, that's just my opinion. And so I get to compliment, in a way, my conversation partner and say, I think better of you. I don't think you really believe that. I think that goes against all your moral intuitions. That cuts against the grain of what you know inside of you. You really believe and you act as though that really is evil. And I, I pressed on that. That's not so much an argument as it is just kind of a pressing on the conscience. And I pressed hard and you could tell he was being hard-hearted and very stubborn and uh, not um, just not reasonable. Uh, he was just trying to really escape the God conclusion. And, um, and you know, I, I, a couple points I said, you know, I bet you have political positions. And I bet you have certain opinions about politicians that operate off of the assumption that certain positions really are evil or good. And certain impulses we have, certain political impulses we have to treat people well come from deeper impulses uh, about human value and ethics. And uh, you could tell when I brought up, uh, I bet you have political opinions that assume real good and real wrong. And he kind of said, yeah, yeah. Then we swayed it, we, 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 we re redirected it away from the sort of the intellectual argument and the, the press I had on him about his position to, I asked him, have you ever done anything unethical? And that's my word here for sin that you should feel ashamed of. And I felt like it went from being cold and apathetic and stubborn to soft. And there was almost like a melting of the heart. It was just, there was a loosening up. And he said, yes. And there was no argument there. And so we got to talk then about how religion and the world try to deal with the shame in different ways. Some of his shame is misplaced. Uh, he ought not feel shame about certain things that he should feel shame about. But there are at least certain things that he ought to and does feel shame about. Unethical things that he's done or felt. And he, he agreed there. And um, what religion typically tries to do is it tries to construct a morality that helps you feel better about yourself. You sort of sort of crowd out your, your shame by thinking about yourself as a righteous person because you can participate in its worthiness standards. Or secularism or the world of the zeitgeist of modernity is um, that of, of, uh, uh, of, of today, uh, is that of technology and social media and Netflix, um, of just the world of just, just consuming yourself with entertainment and uh, consuming media and uh, adopting certain uh, political passions so that, so that um, you can suppress your shame or cope, have coping mechanisms for your shame or invalidate the shame. And then we got to Christianity, the gospel. Christianity is different from all that because what it ultimately does is it hits the shame the, the rightly placed shame, head on. And it doesn't, it doesn't uh, say, you know, I can be worthy. No, it just says, not worthy, not righteous. I do have rightly felt shame. And moreover, I have rightly felt shame ultimately because God expects of me of what I have not produced. And Christianity says, I'm not qualified. I deserve the shame and I deserve punishment for the things that are shameful. But God loves me in this way. He sent his son to die on the cross to absorb the penalty and the, the shame, the price, the curse that I deserve. He absorbs that on the cross. He receives that. And the gospel is that if he would trust, if he would believe in Jesus as that Jesus, then his shame would be canceled. He would be forgiven. 
and that he would be now liberated and empowered to go forward and have a relationship with God and relationship with people that's liberated from shame, not because he hasn't done things shameful, but because he's forgiven and loved and accepted and counted righteous in Christ. So from there, it was a really sweet because I felt like there was more of a receptivity. Um, I don't know where he's at. He was able to talk to other Christians that night. Um, but then we had to talk about um, what he might do for Christian fellowship back out east of Maryland. And um, he asked questions like, well, what if, you know, what if we're all doing something that God doesn't like that we've been doing for decades and then we just find out that, you know, it's wrong. And we talked about how God is very gracious with his people and mercy, we just thought it's some practical Christian stuff. So I'll end that story here, but one more story. Um, <clears throat> I really enjoyed last night because I was basking in the joy of other Christians having so many conversations around me. It's such a delight to watch all that was going around me and I just, I just enjoyed it. And the uh, people, young men from the Righteous Branch or the Peterson Group, largely based out of Nevada, came to do their own missionary work. They're missionaries. Uh, they travel down to the Manti pageant often to talk, and they, Christians eat them up in a good way. We love on them, we love bomb them, we, we take them in, we, we, we take up all their time. We, they get so much gospel from the Christians. They're deeply loved by the Christians. These are, it's pretty funny, you can recognize them because they've got solid, they got like solid color pants, uh, solid color button up shirts that have kind of a peculiar set of co palette of colors, and then a belt, and you can say, oh, those are the Righteous Branch, um, fundamentalist, Mormon, polygamist young men, young male missionaries. And so I got to meet a new one, uh, a, uh, oh my goodness, what is his name? Oh, I was 19 years old. His name suddenly escapes me, I'm sorry. Maybe it'll come to me. And uh, uh, it was just kind of an awkward start of a conversation. And uh, I didn't know where to go with it, so I, I kind of just asked him, hey, can I show you a Bible verse? And so I got to show him Romans verse four, verses four and five. I have this this ridiculously gigantic Bible that I originally got because of uh, low light conditions at Temple Square at the North Gate, flashlights out. So you just get a big Bible. And I've learned to really love this Bible, so I get it out. And people, their eyes just look at big, like, whoa, that's huge. And we, we walk through Romans 4, verses 4 and 5. When a man works, his wages are not counted to him as a gift, but as his due. But to the, and to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So we circled back around and went through all the phrases of those two verses with reading comprehension focus, asking questions at each phrase and clause. Now what is this person not doing? They're not working in verse 5. What is this person doing in uh, verse 4? They're working. And what do they get? Wages. Are all these wages a gift? No. What are they? They are his due. And what is this contrasted with? The one who doesn't work. He's not working, but what is he doing? He's trusting, but who is he trusting in? He's trusting in a, a God. What kind of God? He's trusting in the God who justifies the ungodly. But what is justification? Justification is to be declared righteous. And uh, this is the neat part of the conversation. Um, I asked him, what's the, what's the opposite of justification in a courtroom setting? And he goes, I think it starts with the C, held that con, Condem condemnation, yes, condemnation. Um, so yes, and he goes, oh, I really appreciate that. He likes considering things with the flip side, he like the opposites. He thinks clearly when, it, when you have contrast. So I, I, like, I like considering the flip side of things. Uh, the, uh, the flip side of justification is condemnation, to be declared or pronounced guilty, as opposed to being pronounced and declared righteous. And I looked at it and in the verse together, so you know, the person here who's trusting God for being justified is ungodly. This person is trusting God to pronounce him righteous even though he's not righteous. He's trusting God to pronounce him godly even though he's not godly. And, um, gosh, what was his name? Ah, he, uh, he said, you know, the flip side of that is for a righteous person to be pronounced guilty. But that's impossible, he said. And all of my Christian uh, sensibilities were tickled. And it was like, because he just said, you know, the opposite is a righteous person being declared sinful. And I just, like, 
yes, yes, I love where you're going with that. So that's up. That's impossible, he said. Well, think about the paradox of a, an ungodly person being counted godly. Christ on the cross, righteous, guiltless, sinless, pure, is counted a sinner. Th thus, the great exchange. Me, the ungodly person, Christ, the righteous person. Yet I am counted righteous, and Christ is counted as unrighteous. My sin credited to Christ, and Christ's righteousness credited to me. It's a beautiful, great exchange of double imputation. And uh, I think some light bulbs went off, and we, we kind of just circled, we circled back around over and over. And I encouraged him, please go and read Romans 4, the first chunks of it, come back, and let's continue more of a conversation. So you can, you can pray for him. I wish I remembered his name. It could have been Andrew or Jonathan, I forget. Um, but uh, that's, that's uh, that was last night. Probably more stories to share, but I'll stop there. That's the update. Love you guys.